I'm Steve Backshaw, and you're listening to the Aussie Wildlife Show. Hey guys, welcome to the Aussie Wildlife Show. Adrian here, and I'm here, of course, with Steve. Good day, guys. And we've got with us Dr. Jeremy Austin from the Australian Centre for Ancient DNA of the University of Adelaide. Welcome, Jeremy. Good day. How are you going? Yeah, good, mate. Now, um, can you tell us a little bit about what that means, the Australian Centre for Ancient DNA? Mm. So, uh, it's not DNA from your grandma. It's uh, DNA that we get from uh, old, and sometimes that can be very, very old, and you know, hundreds of thousands of years, but it could also be hundreds of years old. Um, bones, teeth, soil, uh, feces, called coprolites, museum specimens, remains of deceased animals, plants, or humans, or bacteria that tell us something about past environments or past evolution or you know past ecologies of of particular places and so that ancient dna is uh yeah dna that we recover from usually bones and teeth but i say sometimes museum skin sometimes soil uh, sometimes unusual sources and we use that it's a bit like sort of time travel to sort of see what the world was like hundreds thousands tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of years ago so you can pick DNA out of things that are thousands of years old. Yeah, and initially, when all this sort of ancient DNA field started 30 years ago, people were just extracting DNA from, you know, museum skins and bones in museums. But recently, you know, as an example of just how sensitive and this methodology has become, people are now getting Neanderthal DNA from sediment in caves. So there's no Neanderthal bones in these caves. So the Neanderthals went in, shed some skin, scratched themselves, some hair fell out, you know, maybe they went to the toilet in the corner, and that's left these tiny traces of their DNA that's just sat in the soil in these caves for 30,000, 40,000 years, and people can now get Neanderthal DNA from those soil samples and everything else that was in there. So, you know, maybe they came in with and had a meal of a, of a horse or a bison or a mammoth or something, and you can pick that DNA up as well, or any plant material. It, it's incredible... Now, the more we look in places, the more DNA you can find. That's amazing. Mm. So you've got some pretty sophisticated equipment to like look at things yeah. like DNA. Yeah, and the, so the, the important thing to understand is that DNA in a living cell is all packaged up nicely inside the nucleus and it's all nicely arranged and organised and there's lots of it. But when an animal or a plant or a bacteria dies, that DNA starts to break down into smaller and smaller pieces. So the DNA we find in all these old remains is chopped up into tiny little fragments. And so it's like trying to assemble, you know, if you want to get a Neanderthal genome or a um, mammoth genome or a thylacine genome or anything else, it's like taking, you know, a trillion piece jigsaw puzzle, getting all those little pieces of of the jigsaw puzzle and then sitting there trying to piece them all together. Um, and that's the technology in the last 15, 20 years has, has allowed us to do that where we can now sequence the DNA of all these tiny little bits and then use you know, supercomputers to effectively assemble all those pieces back together like putting a big jigsaw puzzle back together to get a, either a whole genome or little bits of the genome to say something about that animal or plant or bacteria that lived you know, thousands of years ago or hundreds of thousands of years ago. So does that mean it's possible then, or it might become possible to bring back extinct animals? Well, that's a bit of a contentious issue because there's, there's some people who think, A, it's possible, and B, we should do it uh, because we can now sequence genomes of extinct animals or extinct plants. The issue there is ex- when people say, I've sequenced the genome of a mammoth, they haven't really sequenced the whole genome. They've sequenced maybe sort of 70 80% of it because there's bits of genomes of every living organism that are almost impossible to assemble because it's repetitive DNA or there's other issues in terms of actually sorting out what the order is. Um, There's also mistakes. So a sequenced genome, it won't be a perfectly sequenced genome. It won't be an exact replica of the original DNA genome. And we also know that um, some mistakes in a DNA sequence are fatal, but you don't know which ones are going to be fatal until you try so we can sequence most of the genome of extinct animals. We can probably now create artificial copies of that genome, or we're getting close to being able to do that. 
there's certainly the technology for putting that artificial DNA into cells and you know trying to get that cell to grow. Um, but I still think it's a long way off growing or producing an animal that was extinct, you know, a thousand years ago or ten thousand years ago. And then there's all the sort of moral and ethical questions about, well, should we do it? You know, should we bring, if we could bring back a thylacine tomorrow or a Tasmanian tiger or a mammoth or a Neanderthal or a dinosaur you know, or a, dinosaur <laughs> or a um, dodo, you know, or any of the other hundreds of animals that have gone extinct in the last couple of thousand years, should we spend millions and it could be, you know, millions and millions of dollars doing so if there's nowhere for them to live. They just end up as curiosities in zoos. Um, or could we put that money towards trying to save the tens of thousands of species that might go extinct in the next 10 years uh, and preserve those things instead? Um, and I'm fair, well, I personally am of the view that we should be putting that money into saving the things we can save as opposed to creating curiosities that people can go and see in zoos. That's a fair point. Yeah, it's a fair point. It's like, it's like when people say, should we go to Mars or should we just focus on protecting this planet? Mm -hmm. But can we do both? Uh, well, yeah, that's a good question, isn't it? <laughs> I, think, I think some people think, no, we can't. We should be trying to save the planet we're on rather than looking for somewhere, and you know, a, a option uh, B to go to. Um, but I guess there's, a, there's all sorts of those moral questions about if someone has the money to build a spaceship to go to Mars and they want to do that versus... Savings, you know, starving people or or paying, buying more COVID vaccines. Well, you know, where does that money go, and how how do you morally and ethically justify how people spend their own cash? That's a really yeah, that's an interesting point. Because I, sorry, go on. Okay. I was going to say there'd be a lot of people with a, with too much money that would probably want to put money into seeing some of these curiosities yeah. brought back again. Mm -hmm. um, but you make a great point. There's no habitat for a thylacine to go to. Mm -hmm. Or is there? Like, could we put one in the western half of Tasmania and uh, or, or one? <laughs> That'd be good, wouldn't it? One. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, you'd, you'd need a few. I yes, mean, yeah. and, and thylacines are the, or Tassie tiger, sorry, are the sort of things where there probably is habitat still in Tasmania where they could survive. Of course, the the problem is you release them in the wild; they're a curiosity. People are going to go out, you know, hunting them <laughs> because they're going to want pet ones. <laughs> uh, then you, you almost create a you know, illegal wildlife trade problem at the same time. Um, whereas mammoths, you know, there's there's all sorts of crazy ideas about, well, you could recreate mammoths and then release them into, you know, Alaska. And it's like, well, who's going to want to have mammoths stomping around in Alaska? Uh, is there habitat there for them? Um, you know, are they... Do we know what they're going to do? You know, are they going to go around, you know, smashing up cars and people's houses and killing people? Or are they going to live sort of peacefully? With, you know, that's, a, that's another sort of problem isn't it but with the mammoths you can rule out the pet trade yes <laughs> <laughs> can you though you know, probably not no. <laughs> um well you know who, who was that there was that drug lord in in um south america who had his own herd of um hippos well they still live there don't that, they? well El, El and he, Chapo or somebody yeah and yeah, then he someone. you know he got put in prison so the hippos have now escaped so they've now got a hippo problem in yeah. south america because, <laughs> yeah. because they're all over the place killing people and hippos are dangerous animals they're massive they yeah. get up to five and a half meters long so they're like well, what do we do with all these wild hippos that are now spreading up and down the rivers in in whichever country it was you in put south america mammoths there to wipe <laughs> them out <laughs> it's obvious. I think they're herbivores. <laughs> well, you can change that. Yeah, we, yeah. Can, we can genetically engineer <laughs> can them and make them that. carnivorous <laughs> ma mammoths. This podcast <laughs> took, took a turn. Oh, yeah, it did. <laughs> All right. It did. There'll be scientists out there now going, hmm, it's yeah. a fair point. <laughs> <laughs> so if we, if we actually work towards bringing back, say, something like the thylacine, mm -hmm. would it be pure thylacine? Would it ever be a pure, 100% pure thylacine? I don't think so, no. I think what you'd end up with is something that looks very much like a thylacine, probably acts like a thylacine, but in terms of a you know, strictly evolutionary lineage, it wouldn't be a thylacine that was an exact link back to original thylacines. And I don't have a problem with that. Like, if you've got a... If you want to bring an animal or create an animal that looks like a thylacine, acts like a thylacine, does the same ecological role, but it actually isn't a thyla you know, it isn't a true thylacine that evolved over millions and millions of years, 
Um, I don't have a problem with that as long as it doesn't become another cat or fox. And that's, that's the potential problem is if you're going to genetically engineer something that you think is going to be, looks like a thylacine, acts like a thylacine, behaves like a thylacine, but then turns out to be you know, another cane toad or a fox or a cat and ends up being some ecological disaster, then you will end up with a lot of egg on your face. Yeah, it's almost like you'd want to put it into one of the AWC fenced areas mm-hmm. because, I mean, they've got a lot of those areas are breeding and um, doing a great job at breeding a lot of herbivorous marsupials, but there's not a lot of carnivores in no. there. Um, slowly they're, they're changing that, but... Mm-hmm. I mean, that would be a shock to their system. Here you go, guys. Here's some thylacines. Yeah, because they'd probably be very successful now, wouldn't they? Well, like, with yeah, well, things like rabbits and foxes, and mm-hmm. they would possibly be quite successful. I think the, the problem with thylacines is that because they went extinct so early on, people really don't know so much about their ecology. So people have looked at their bite force and their likely sort of prey items they're going to eat. But, you know, were they sort of an active hunter like a dingo or a cat or a fox or were they more carrion eaters like a um, Tassie devil and you know if their population size was never that big in Tasmania anyway which maybe they maybe there were only a couple of thousand of them in the whole of Tasmania when Europeans turned up you know what what role were they um, performing um, and are they sort of a real ecologically important animal to have in the landscape Whereas something like, you know, perhaps Tassie Devils, because they are carrion eaters and they do hunt um, and we know that, that they might help control cats, maybe they're a better thing to be putting inside these exclosures to, to help keep um, some balance in the herbivore populations because we know what they do. You know, we're not genetically engineering and we also need to have insurance populations for Tassie Devils from des- devil facial tumour disease. So you're actually kind of do two beneficial things at once one you put a native um, predator in to control um, native herbivores two you create insurance populations for devils and because we know devils were on the mainland up until 3,000 years ago you're not creating something that was never there in the first place and eventually you know there is a lot of arguments that we should be releasing devils outside of fence reserves on the mainland because they might help control foxes and cats. And if they do that, then all the other local you know, small mammal populations should start increasing. Um, and it's a win-win for everybody. And you don't have to genetically engineer something. You know, you've got, you've got devils, and they know how to breed devils, and they know how to breed them in captivity. They've got insurance populations, and devils are threatened with extinction in Tasmania. So you could spend all that money and resources, instead of bringing back thylacines, of saying, right, we're going to not only save devils but we're going to bring them back onto the mainland and they can serve all sorts of really critical ecological roles both inside fence reserves and outside on these sort of more landscape scale um, restoration projects yeah that's a really good point i just want to clear something up um we had a guest on recently that said that devils were around 300 years ago Mm -hmm. and that may have been a uh, a slip of the tongue and 3000 is what you're saying yeah so we've we've looked at radiocarbon dates for um, Tassie devils on the mainland and Tasmanian tigers on the mainland and modelled the extinction date for both of those species and it's pretty much bang on 3,050 or 3,100 years before present Okay, for both of them. We can't call them Tasmanian tigers when they're on the mainland. No, but then <laughs> calling them mainland tigers it and mainland weird, devils it? sounds a bit weird. It does sound weird. It does sound I think you call them common tigers. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> just call them thylacine devils yeah. and without, the, without the geolocation part of the name. <laughs> um, so you made an interesting point when you said that thylacines may have been in low numbers in Tasmania. Like They're the last member of the thylacine it's the family they yep. belong to yep. so do you think maybe there's some evidence to think that they may have been a bit of a on their way out species certainly that you could make that argument because um up until a couple of million years ago there were lots more species of thylacines in australia and that it was quite a diverse group um and generally when diverse groups slowly whittle down until you get one species um there's possibly a reason for that um, exactly what that reason is, we don't know. Uh, it doesn't look like 
there, the populations of thylacines in Tasmania were ever, you know, huge. It wasn't like there were millions of them running around because the bounty scheme, I don't think, ever paid out more than a couple of thousand um, uh, bounties for thylacine scalps. So, yeah, the population in Tasmania wasn't big. They had gone extinct on the mainland. You know, there's some arguments over what that cause might be. But, yeah, maybe they were one of these species that was you know, about to disappear anyway. I mean, that doesn't make it any better that Europeans push them over the edge um, because, you know, if, if thylacines had had maybe another 20 or 30 years uh, and people had worked out captive breeding programs for them in the 1940s or 50s, then maybe they wouldn't have gone extinct. Yeah, that would have been really good if people did that. I mean, that's a, a good argument for native animals in captivity because people would be having pet thylacines right now, and I think that's good. Mm. But even the captivity side, like if, if, you, if, the, if the people back then had the education that we've got now, which would have been hard back then, then they would, probably would have protected them back then and we might have still had them here, I guess. Mm. I mean, yeah, they were, they were protected. They officially were made protected in 1936. Which was too late. Which was the year they went extinct. Mm. Yeah. yeah. It's a bit sad. Mm. Um, on the mainland, the dingo played a role potentially yep. in their demise mm -hmm. and with the devil too. Yes. So there's a lot of arguments among scientists about what caused the extinction of devils and thylacines on the mainland. And what we do know is both devils and thylacines were once widespread on the mainland. So there's um, Aboriginal rock art of both of those species in northern Australia. There's bones of both species in caves all across southern Australia. Um, and so we know that both of those animals were widespread on the mainland so living in both you know wetter eucalypt forest but also in more arid areas uh, and in tropical areas up until 3000 years ago um and they must have been reasonably common because their bones are, are, are relatively common in the caves along uh, the southern coast of australia um, and so the, there's been this ongoing sort of debate about what caused the extinction. Why would you lose two of the largest remaining terrestrial carnivores on the mainland and yet they both managed to survive in Tasmania until Europeans uh, arrived? And the, or the theories are either climate change, so um, about four or 5,000 years ago, or up until about four or 5,000 years ago, the climate in Australia was relatively stable during the first part of the Holocene. And then the ENSO activity kicked in, so those La Nina, um, El Nino, El Nino uh, cycles yeah. started to kick in and created um, variability in climate. So we went from a relatively stable climate to huge amounts of variation. And that may have been enough to start or suppress populations of, of apex predators. At the same time, uh, human populations, so Aboriginal human populations, were also increasing, and the, uh, those pop some of those populations were um, being less nomadic and, and were settling down and forming um, more kind of stable uh, communities. And as a consequence of that, of increased human population size and the fact that they weren't necessarily moving around as much, uh, that may have put additional hunting pressure on on devils and thylacines obviously you know humans don't want to compete with other predators perhaps they um deliberately hunted uh, devils and thylacines and then the third uh theory for their extinction is at, at also at the same time sort of four or five thousand years ago dingoes were introduced into australia by humans uh, and they very quickly spread out over the entire continent obviously except tasmania they couldn't get across bass strait because bass strait was flooded and there was no human movement across Bass Strait, so they weren't carrying dingoes in, you know, canoes or boats. Um, and dingoes are, is a good argument for the extinction of two other carnivores because dingoes are a carnivore. They're also placental mammals, uh, and we know that when you put placental mammals up against a marsupial mammal, generally the placental mammals win. Uh, and so that's one of the um, main arguments for how or why thylacines and devils went extinct on the mainland. They were just either eaten by um, dingoes or outcompeted by dingoes. And uh, there's been lots of arguments in the literature about uh, why, why or how each of these three causes might have been more important than the others. Um, and so 15 years ago maybe, um, we were thinking, well, what if we could get some DNA from devils in Tasmania 
and thylacines in Tasmania and also DNA from devils and thylacines on the mainland and actually use that DNA to track the population history of the populations on the mainland particularly and see was there a very gradual decline to extinction or was it a very you know sharp uh, decline to extinction and that might help us explain why they went extinct so um, I tripped around museums and sampled bones um, in museums from caves across southern Australia so um, bones in Western Australia um, some from South Australia some from Victoria and New South Wales and then also traveled around museums around the world to get um, DNA samples from uh, bones and museum skins of thylacines and Tassie devils from mostly from Tasmania um, and then when we had two PhD students one who was working on the devil material and another working on the thylacine material and when they got the DNA out of that material and looked at the DNA from the mainland versus Tasmania we saw a striking pattern of um, lots of diversity on the mainland that that had quite deep um, sort of ancestral uh, connections but all the diversity in Tasmania both thylacines and devils uh, traces back to about three or four thousand years ago exactly at the point that they these species went extinct on the mainland so there's a what we call a population bottlenecks happened in Tasmania uh, at precisely the same time that both species went extinct on the mainland so you had all this diversity on the mainland that went extinct something happened in Tasmania where we lost a huge amount of diversity and then the populations, both species went through a bottleneck and then have expanded out in terms of the diversity we see. And the only explanation we can come up with is that human intensification wasn't occurring in Tasmania, so we can't, we can't uh, put humans down as the cause of this bottleneck. There were no dingoes in Tasmania, so they couldn't have caused a population bottleneck. So the only thing we can uh, explain this pattern is that the climate change, the increase in the ENSO activity, caused a decline in devils and thylacines in Tasmania, but they never went extinct. They managed to, they went down to a small population size, but there was no additional pressure. There was no dingoes and there was no human hunting them. So they went down to a small size and then just managed to sneak through and then uh, expanded back out again. Whereas on the mainland, those populations started to decline due to climate change and then they got hit by humans and dingoes. So those a combination of two or three of those factors um, wiped them out. Wow, that's so interesting. It's mm. so fascinating that you can tell that from DNA. I was going to say, like when you say like the, the, how quickly the demise happens mm -hmm. and things like that, you tell through DNA, is that because they're how related they are? Yeah, so the, you can, by sampling bones of extinct animals over through time, you can get pinpoints of genetic diversity as you go through time and you can use that genetic diversity to effectively model the size of the population and so people are doing this now on all sorts of things um, you know horses and mammoths and humans and um, thylacines and devils and all sorts of stuff so you can cr create a, a curve of population size um, that helps you understand how or what sorry when the population size changed and how dramatic how dramatic that was um, and so you you could but perhaps if you had um, DNA from um, thylacines in Tasmania that predates this 3,000 year bottleneck you could possibly say well maybe they were on this long slow steep decline you now they were sort of slowly dribbling out to extinction anyway uh, compared to the mainland where it appears they went extinct quite rapidly over a very large area so right across southern australia the extinction happened more or less simultaneously so when you're looking at those extinct animals and looking at that process mm -hmm. you can kind of replicate that to something that's highly endangered now and almost do some testing to how to outcross these things and make them stronger for the future yeah there's there's certainly um a lot of that information from those historical samples those ancient samples that can be used to then kind of flip and say okay we know this is what's happened in terms of extinction of thylacines and devils and mammoths and dodos and you know all sorts of other extinct animals how can we use that information to then uh, help understand what's going on in species that are almost extinct now and what can we do in terms of genetics to 
um, improve the genetic health of those populations uh, for the future so that they actually have a chance of surviving into the future without being you know, animals in zoos for the rest of eternity. Yeah, you were talking um, before we started recording about some of the fenced off mm-hmm. feral exclusion areas with animals and stocking those with animals from the wild um, actually looking at the genetics of the animals we're putting in there for maybe more bang for your buck genetically yep yeah so there's um, lots I think there's more than 30 fenced reserves in Australia now where fences are put up and all the feral animals inside the fence are eradicated so f- foxes cats rabbits you know, camels, donkeys, goats, everything is, is, is removed. And then uh, endangered species are put inside that fence and effectively left to uh, grow in population size and it creates a safe haven effectively for these threatened species where they're not going to be eaten by foxes and cats mostly and other animals aren't going to eat all their food. Um, and so they're effectively protected from threatening processes and the most important threatening process in Australia for native animals uh, are predation by foxes and cats and habitat loss so people you know clearing land Um, but one of the problems with those reintroductions is you take you grab a handful of animals and you put them inside the fence and you let them go and you have to hope that uh, there's enough males and females and the population structure is okay and uh, of those founding individuals they all have offspring that survive and those offspring have offspring that survive so that the genetic diversity of that population is maintained through time and that doesn't always happen so we know for example that when you put 20 individuals inside a enclosure a big enclosure and let them go some of them are going to die in the first year some of them won't breed and so you, you you're effectively creating a population bottleneck in that translocated population that loses genetic diversity very very quickly and when and when and we know that when animals populations or plant populations lose genetic diversity then we see an increasing in inbreeding and in something called inbreeding depression which is usually um, uh, it reduces animal survival and their ability to breed and you have all these weird morph- morphological um, problems and uh, low sperm count and low reproductive outputs and things so at the moment there's a lot of interest in in developing methods to optimize how we mix populations to maximize genetic diversity and how we track the success of those individuals that we put in at the at the start uh, in terms of how much of their genetic diversity survives after one five ten or a hundred generations uh, and that's critical because translocation programs cost an enormous amount of money you know building fences is is very expensive removing all the f- uh, foxes and cats and rabbits and everything else inside those fences is incredibly expensive maintaining the fences so you've got to actually make sure that foxes and foxes and cats and rabbits can't get under or over the fence um, sourcing the wild animals and then getting them inside the fence is expensive normally you have to do this quite rapidly so you've got to, you've got to charter aircraft uh, and then you've got to monitor the population for years afterwards uh, and if some or all of those things don't work particularly well then the translocation fails and there's lots of examples of failed translocations in Australia where fences you know that people ran out of money the fences couldn't be maintained uh, predators got inside the fence and started killing things so having that genetic information to maximize the genetic diversity of the population for long-term you know evolutionary sort of consequences is really really important um, and that's kind of where some of our research is going now is taking DNA from founders so animals that are introduced into a population and then monitoring the population through time to see okay how many of those founders have actually contributed to um, the genetic diversity and we've had uh, you know one honor student um, looking at uh, the genetics of western quolls introduced into arid recovery reserve and we found or she found there that in the very first year of breeding, they had, I think it was like four males and eight females, but only one of the males actually fathered most of the young in the first generation. So that's already a problem, is that three of the males really didn't produce any, any offspring, so you've already created a population bottleneck. And as a consequence of that, that male, the successful male, has been pulled out of that reserve <laughs> and replaced with a couple more so that we don't have these uh, issues of genetic diversity. It's a bit like a ship gets sunk, 
you know, six people wash up on an island and one male ends up fathering all the offspring. And so they're all related to each other and they all start having kids together and you can see very quickly that inbreeding is going to become a big problem. So, uh, yeah, that genetic information is really, really useful for those translocation programs. And you can reverse the relativeness of those animals you can do that yeah so um that's now it's that's also becoming common is when people say identify using genetics that oh, okay we've got a potential inbreeding problem here then they'll go and grab some more males or females from another population a genetically different population and bring them in to you know increase the diversity in that population it's a bit you know, the um, zoos have been doing this for years with stud books. So in their captive breeding programs, they keep stud books of all the animals so they know who's bred with who and who's related to who. And then they deliberately move animals around to minimise brothers and sisters or um, mums and uh, sons or fathers and daughters breeding with each other. And in wild situations, in fenced enclosures, you obviously can't keep stud books, but you can monitor the population through time and identify individuals that are overrepresented in the next generation and either remove those individuals or add additional males or females to try and uh, level out the, the those negative impacts of one individual being the most successful breeder. I guess in those 30 fenced off areas roughly in Australia can sort of work together on that as well like all the zoos do. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah mm-hmm. and that and that would that would be really useful is to actually treat all of those fenced reserves, not as individual reserves, but actually as a meta population, where you can just move animals around, um, and use in in, a, in let's say one reserve is particularly successful with I don't know with let's say with quolls, and they've got too many quolls, but another reserve you know they've had some problems, and so you could actually move animals from the more successful one to the less successful one, and if you if you know the genotypes of all the animals, then you can hand pick individual animals to that are going to help the less successful population in terms of its genetics while also reducing you know the sort of predator pre- pressure in the in the more successful reserve and you could do that with herbivores um i mean it's it's not necessarily cheap but certainly that's it's an area that a lot of people are thinking about now um in australia for these um these translocation programs mm. is it an expensive process to determine the genotype of a species or an it animal sounds it doesn't it <laughs> Does it? I mean, because Steve's got um, Owen Pelly pythons, mm. and there's not a lot of those in captivity. Mm-hmm. Um, I think reptiles. I'm not sure, but I kind of was always led to believe that, like a, a clutch of python eggs, are almost quite unrelated within that one clutch, whereas mammals are not so much. It, yeah, different. Not unrelated, but you know, the, dogs yeah. can. They can't. They a dog can a female can lay a litter of pups and each pup could be sighed by a different male yeah so some in some species females should i do something about that bird sorry i think sorry. the listeners are used to that poxy you reckon bird. they're used to that poxy bird <laughs> <laughs> sorry about rocky no. everybody um <laughs> sorry is that is that distracting for you no it's not right? distracting you're for right? me it's all part of the atmos no okay sorry mate Carry no on. you're right <laughs> um yeah so different species uh use different mating strategies so in some cases females will mate with multiple males or females will use sperm storage, so they'll mate with multiple males and they store sperm, and then you end up with sperm competition inside the female. Uh, and yes, yes, so you can end up in situations where a female can have a clutch or a group of offspring, and they're all fathered by different males, uh, whether it's eggs in snakes or baby quolls. So we know in, in some species of quolls, a female can have you know six young, and they'll be fathered by three different males all born at the same time because the female the females use sperm, sperm storage and there's all sorts of theories about the whole why, why do animals use sperm storage one is if females don't come across males very often then you know they get the chance to grab the sperm and then they store it for when when they actually want to reproduce in others females want to maximize the diversity of their offspring and so what they do is they go around lots of males and basically collect sperm up and then that sperm competition occurs inside the female, so the you know the best sperm ends up um, fertilising most of the young. Um, and there's lots of other theories about you know why these sort of things evolve, but but yeah, it can relate result in um, a one mother having offspring from multiple fathers. Humans can't do that, can they? No, didn't think so. <laughs> Thought I'd ask. <laughs> you heard it here first, folks. <laughs> I reckon they've probably heard it somewhere else before. They might. Well, things change. Um, You mentioned that you can tell 
how many of an animal there were as we move through time mm-hmm. through the genetics. There was a human bottleneck about 70,000 years ago, is that right? Where there may have been between one and 10,000 individual humans on the planet? Yeah, there's... There's well, the, the story with humans sort of changes every week because every time okay. that you know someone sequences another batch of human genomes, um, the, the analysis you know changes the story slightly. But but certainly in some parts of the world, um, human populations have gone through bottlenecks at, at various points in time, um, either due to you know some sort of climate impact or a disease impact or something else. Something else you know we may not necessarily always know. Um, but certainly, yeah, human populations haven't necessarily just skyrocketed from the dawn of time. You know, they have gone up and down depending on all sorts of factors. Well, I guess now we've got less chance of things like that because we're so good at staying alive now. Yes. And fighting diseases yep. and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, we've, we've sort of shielded ourselves from normal evolutionary forces by, uh, you know, science and medicine and um, clothing and, you know, heating and building homes and all sorts of things. So a lot of those evolutionary forces which would have acted on human populations you know thousands of years ago don't tend to work on us anymore mm. but i guess this covid19 is sort of proof of that as well isn't it because i was amazed to find out that in england their death rate in this last year is actually lower than previous years mm-hmm. because people have been locked down and yep no flu going through yep. people not driving around so even though we thought covid was going to be you know, or possibly was going to kill a lot of people. It's actually killed less than a normal year with normal other things that go on. Because people aren't out going out doing, doing dangerous mm. things. Yeah, mm. <laughs> yeah it's is, interesting. Whereas normally that would have been a big wipeout. Of, yep. You yep. Know, of, not a wipeout, but yeah, mm. a cut down of the human population. A cleansing. A cleansing. <laughs> um, <laughs> wow. Now, just to bring it back to plants... <laughs> Steve oh, loves God. it when I talk about plants. Um, <laughs> when I when I got into local native plants, bloody nearly thirty years ago now, mm-hmm. but people would talk about you know always collect seed from like you know a, a certain radius, and a couple of k's at the most, so you're using local provenance. But now with all the national parks being so disjunct and islandized and things, is it good to get something uh, the same species but a bit further out and you know that kind there's, of stuff? There's there are a lot of arguments against that. Local is best. For a number of reasons, one is because populations of plants are also getting bottlenecked, so they're getting chopped up in you know the the the, the range is getting chopped up into as you said small little isolated bits, and in those isolated bits, if the plants aren't using wind pollination, so they were re- relying on birds or insects, then you end up with inbreeding effects in these little localized populations. Um, and those plants, if they're inbred, aren't very well adapted to anywhere anymore. So there is an argument now that you should be mixing seeds or plants from different locations. And also with the impact of climate change, uh, as climate gets hotter or drier or does whatever it's going to do, um, actually sourcing seed from an area that is drier or, or hotter or... Um, has more extreme summers and moving that seed to a place which is going to have that sort of climate in the next 100 years is also a justified sort of strategy and people are doing that already. They're already, they're already saying, okay, we'll go, we'll go and collect seed from all over the place um, from different sorts of environments and niches and climates and then use that for uh, a revegetation site and let that diversity of seed decide which are the best adapted plants for this new local environment. Yeah, and would that that's interesting. And would that translate to animals as well? Like, if like a national park has a species that it's very unlikely to get through suburbia to another mm-hmm. national park, mm-hmm. will we do that with animals? It's just re- sorry. It's just really strange to me, like to think that we have these conversations about animals, but it's actually plants as well that this all oh, completely fuck, how relates doing this to podcast? Yeah, but, <laughs> you know, but DNA in plants and things like that it's just really quite I just sat here <sighs> thinking well this is strange but the, the super the super good thing with plants is you can do all these sort of common garden experiments so in it with animals you can't it's very hard to take a highly endangered species of animal and do some weird sort of crossbreeding and then stick it out in the bush and and see whether it works. Whereas you can do that with plants. So you can go and get, um, you know, pollen 
from all over the range of this species and then fertilise, you know, one plant with all these different sorts of pollen, then collect the seed and then plant that seed out in various places and then grow it under, under local conditions say, what happens? And you don't need animal ethics and you can just put a fence up to stop the kangaroos coming and all the rabbits coming in and eating. Or it's, it's so much easier than doing this on, on animals. And you could create some plant that's just the best type of food or something for a native mm. animal as well if, yeah. if they're and, struggling and, with it. I know, again, I know people at the university who are doing this now on, on all sorts of threatened plants in South Australia where they can do these little experiments and say, if we mix, you know, plant X from over here and plant X uh, from over here and then collect the seed and plant it out in a, you know, these common garden experiments, you just put it in the ground, see what happens, let it, so see if can it survive winters and summers and droughts and floods. Um, and then work out with the genetics, okay, we've mixed these two populations, you know, they're genetically, uh, you know, more diverse than the, either the two sources. Did that result in something useful in terms of their ability to survive, you know, climate change or new conditions or um, being isolated or being surrounded by suburbia or, or whatever? Um, and so it's, I'm almost being convinced into, you know, working on conservation of plants because you can actually, you can do the genetics and then you can do the experimental side of it Whereas if I wanted to do the same thing on, say, Western quolls, I'd have to set up fences and I'd have to get all this animal ethics permission and I'd have to source enough animals and, you know, things would go wrong. Um, and it's just so much harder to do on animals. There'll but then plant but, ethics people creating a group now <laughs> after listening to this. But, We're in trouble. Yeah. But, the, but the, that's the really good thing about it. So say you can do the experimental side of it relatively easily and i'm not saying it's it's dead easy to do plant you know experimental uh, stuff because you know a bushfire comes through and burns all your all your plots down and you, and you, or you plant your plants out and you end up with a you know millennial drought and everything dies anyway but at least you have the opportunity to do those experiments or you can do them in glass houses where you manipulate the um the conditions so you deliberately don't water plants or you deliberately make it hotter or you deliberately make it wetter or more or less humid so you sort of create artificial environments and then see how these plants um deal with uh, deal with it of course if it's a long-lived plant you might have to wait 30 years to get the results but but at least it gives you the opportunity to do that so yeah so would you say a more diverse genetic population mm -hmm. is a more robust population in general yes so what we know is that uh, for evolution to occur, we need variation in a population. And the underlying variation that's most important here is genetic variation. And so we're assuming that if a population has lots of genetic diversity, it will also have genetic diversity for um, uh, genes that are related to surviving hot weather or running fast away from um, cats and foxes, or you know the ability to smell a, a new predator in the environment, or the ability to survive on um, different sorts of food. And that allows that population to adapt over time if the environment's changing. And we know the environment's changing. We know uh, that there are new pests and diseases. We know there are new novel predators. We know that um, the climate's changing. So we need diversity in those populations in order for them to adapt to future conditions without us having to necessarily do any sort of hardcore intervention. Can I ask a random question now? Yep. Uh, go on. <laughs> do you think memories can be passed down genetically? No. Oh, Thank you. <laughs> hang on. So there's this, there's this weird part of uh, genetics that I, I don't fully understand called epigenetics where you can effectively put a, a little genetic modification. It's not changing the DNA sequence, but you can somehow put a little tag on the DNA that makes that gene do something slightly different. And those epigenetic modifications can be passed on from one generation to the next in some cases and so i don't know the, the issue is does a memory do some weird epigenetic modification to the dna that's in eggs and sperm because it have to be in eggs and sperm it can't be in your brain that then gets passed on to an next generation i don't know 
I'm yeah. not an expert in epigenetics. We need to, we need some some really hardcore geneticists to to explain that one. Oh, that's why Adrian got you on. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've disappointed well, you. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'll put I'm in. not just for the just for the record. I'm not a hardcore geneticist. <laughs> <laughs> um, I yep. watched a TED talk the other day about someone talking about that, and he was talking about the RNA potentially can pass on memories and he had these very primitive little worm things that he was that they've got such a primitive little brain and he mm-hmm. was doing things with them and it seemed to pass on through rna but okay. i did take a few notes down and i couldn't say much more than that from memory but i'll leave that okay. there. but interesting it was interesting yeah there was another guy back in the 80s and this is all coming out i think it was the 80s but he, he was he was chopping up planarians you know how he was teaching planarians to use mazes those little flat wind yep, yep. and you can chop them up and they all grow like a head will grow into a body and a tail a tail will grow into a body and a head and he was teaching the planarians things and chopping them up and the pieces grew back into new planarians which all remembered which is weird what? so wow. so the argument is like where is memory is it in <laughs> your cells is it in your it's not in your brain you know where is it? it's in your nerves is it only RNA? Who knows? That's it. I certainly don't. Wow. No. Yeah. So when a green tree python hatches out of its egg mm-hmm. and instantly you put a perch and it will go and it will perch correctly as a green tree python yep. will perch yep. and it will use its little end of its tail as a coodle lure mm-hmm. and things like that. That's not memory. That's just that's a, That's hardwired into their DNA. Right. That is something that's controlling behaviour which is not learned, it's... So they almost don't know why they're doing it <laughs> to no, start with. No, It's a bit like uh, birds that don't learn calls. So there's, there's many birds which have innate calls, which if they grew up with no other sound around them, they'd still sing. Whereas most passerines um, have to learn the call. So if they grew up in an environment with no sound, they probably wouldn't make the, the call that is typical for that species because they learn those calls. Whereas other ones, um, uh, it's innate. They're just born with that ability to make that particular call no matter what happens in their environment. Mm, interesting. There's a lot to find out, isn't there? It's there all is. so interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So much to find out and so little uh, time and money to do it. Mm. So is it expensive to, to get the genetic sequence from, from an animal? Yeah, it used to be. It used to be time-consuming, expensive. But now, uh, with all these new DNA sequencing machines, we can, you know, we can go and get a DNA sample from 90 individuals, stick it in a little plate, send it off to a company in Canberra, and for $3,500 they will extract the DNA, sequence all these DNA markers and send us the results. So that ends up being, what, $10, $20 a sample, which is cheap. Wow. Mm. That is cheap. And there's, and there's, no, really there's no actual real labour involved for us at all. You know, it's a bit like um, these, uh, you know, genealogy DNA tests now is that for $150 you can spit in a tube, send it to America, and they send you your DNA results, which is for 700000 different DNA markers spread across your genome. And, you know, 10 years ago, that that would have cost you thousands of dollars to do that. And now, you know, yeah, everyone in the world, well, not everyone in the world, everyone, anyone in the world with a spare 150 bucks can effectively sample, you know, large parts of their genome um, and do whatever you want with it. You know, you can look for family ties, you can look at your genetic, you know, health r- risks, um, but yeah, so and that cost is going to keep coming down. So uh, you know, before too long, um, potentially we're going to have little iPhone-sized machines that you can you know walk out into your backyard and you say, "There's a scat." And oh, I don't know why that is, and you you know rub a bit on your, on the machine, and 20 minutes later, it'll tell you what it is based on the DNA. I thought you were going to say there'll be an app on your iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> well, probably Maybe. Yeah, that's years. right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah the, the 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 cost for that DNA analysis just keeps coming down. And the issue we have is, you know, we've got the skills to to generate the data, but it's, it's people with the computer skills, the bioinformatics skills to handle these enormous amounts of data now that, that are becoming the bottleneck in terms of analyzing, you know, this sort of mater- um, um, information. So it's a lot of information. Yeah, you know, every, every human genome that you sequence you know, is probably a, a terabyte worth of data. And, you know, there's wow. thousands and thousands and thousands of human genomes, but even 
you know, projects that we're doing where we might only get a couple of thousand DNA markers, um, that's still a huge amount of information. And it's more information now that you can then you can manually inspect. So, you know, all the DNA work that I've ever done is very small scale. You can actually manually inspect every DNA sequence, but you just you haven't got the, the time to do that anymore. So you kind of have to believe the technology is, is giving you a, a, a DNA result that actually makes some sense. Up to one terabyte. So when you look at most household computers, don't still don't do one terabyte. No. They're only pretty recent yeah. when you get terabyte memory cut that's unreal and the, mm. the, the 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 computer memory that's required to store all this information is now to the point where um most of the people who are doing lots of say human genome sequencing they don't actually keep the the genome sequences anymore because it's actually cheaper just to go back and re-sequence a sample than pay to store all the data wow. because there just isn't isn't capacity to store it anymore <laughs> really yeah. it's but nuts it, but in respect of the cost to actually do these sequencing mm-hmm. like that that's such a positive for the future of yeah, wildlife and, and plants and, and, and everything which is sort of brings into this new initiative that the threat, threatened species um group in australia have just started which is to spend a reasonably large amount of money doing genetic surveys of all these highly threatened species for all those things we just talked about, you know, maximising translocation success, making sure you're mixing genetically compatible populations to increase the diversity of the of the populations uh, that you've translocated. Uh, how do you come up with really cheap and easy ways to then monitor that those mixed populations are actually continuing into the, into the next generations? Um, and, you know, we're really lucky we're involved in a couple of projects now uh, through that initiative where someone else is paying, or the taxpayer probably is paying for the DNA sequencing part, so someone's generating all the data, so we get to then analyse all this data on, you know, things like western quolls, night parrots, uh, western ground parrots. Um, I would have loved to put um, hairy-nosed wombats in there, northern and southern hairy-nosed wombats. Um, there's probably stuff going on on Tassie devils as well. Um, and you know a whole range of other mammals, birds, uh, frogs, probably snakes as well, and lizards, that are all um, the focus of you know conservation programs. And genetics is now one part of that. It's fascinating. I love it when science actually helps. Like I, I just love it when you, there's, there's actually some positive yep. results from all this hard and, work and money. Yeah, and I think that's the bit I enjoy now is. Rather than just going doing genetic study for the sake because I'm curious, you know, I'm a. I think I got into science because I'm, I'm curious. I like finding stuff out, but half the time it's just I satisfy my own curiosity, and then you don't need to tell anyone else. But for a lot of these conservation programs, you can actually make a big difference in terms of telling conservation managers we think you should do this and this, and here's the reason why we think, as opposed to you know just making up some numbers. Yeah, go and grab twenty. That sounds about right. Uh, we can actually give them, you know, sort of hard numbers to say you need ten individuals from here and ten individuals from there. They, you know, they need to be equal sex ratios, uh, and we've got the tools to then monitor that population. So you are really kind of making a difference, hopefully, to not only the translocation success but also the long-term survival of many, many species in Australia. It's the huge part of the future of conservation, mm. really, isn't it? Mm. And because mm. the, because the cost is coming down. You're also you don't feel like you're some huge drain. Instead of someone being able to put up you know another three kilometres of fence or pay you know hundred thousand dollars on DNA sequencing, the DNA sequencing costs are coming down, which means that the genetic cost of doing this sort of stuff isn't going to be the major part of the the whole conservation program. That's <laughs> awesome. I love that. I love that. Mate, thank you so much. Is there right. anything that you would like to talk about that we haven't talked about? No, I think we've um, we've covered a broad range of stuff, haven't we? <laughs> that, was that, really, was, that was really good. Yeah. 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 Um, and I'm going to see you on Monday. Yes. I'm bringing some critters in. I'm so looking forward to that. That's my highlight of my year, I tell you. Is <laughs> 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 instead of standing in, well, not that we stand in classes anymore because we're still teaching online, is, um, yeah, just actually been able to say remember all those boring lectures i gave you on marsupials and birds and like here they actually are and try to reinforce you know kids uh, memories on on some you know things i told them about marsupial diversity by actually seeing them in the flesh 
and yeah, it's really exciting. I and I I absolutely love it, and I'm glad to know that you're doing stuff out of Roseworthy and and all these you know other things with um, students because yeah, there's just the thing I think I miss about uh, my undergraduate was we had so much hands-on learning. And that's slowly being sort of stripped away and it's more and more online. And you know what it's like. You know, you can't learn about animals, either the biology of animals or how to handle animals or how to care for animals or, you know, just how to identify one from the other unless you've actually touched them or seen them. It's so powerful, isn't it? Yeah. No, I I love coming in because I I learned so much from you. (laughs) Um, And I'm going to bring in a range. I'm going to bring a a wombat so there's a bit of chaos. Excellent. Um, (laughs) I'm going to bring in that bird you've heard squawking the whole afternoon, Rocky, and he's going to, again, with the chaos, yep. he'll be free-flying around yep. the electric theatre, so that good. should wake a few kids up. <laughs> um, but no, it'll be, it'll be good fun, mate. Yeah, yeah, good. Excellent. Mate, thanks so much for coming on. That was brilliant. My I love pleasure. that. Thank you. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, mm. and I think if you're keen, we'll get you on again. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Now we've done it once, it's taken a couple of years to get me up here. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and, mate, um, if you've got time, I'd love to show you around. Yeah, that'd be great. Awesome. All right, right um, guys, Jeremy, thank you. And, guys, thank you for listening. Yeah.